Welcome into another live edition of On the Beat. I have new toys, podcast mic, ear pods. Jeremiah's having camera issues. Nothing like live radio, but we do have Adam and Evan here. And of course, we're always sponsored by Jer- uh, <laughs> Jeremiah. We're always sponsored by Johnny T shirt, Johnny T shirt.com. Guys, I entitled this show The Stretch Run. And quite frankly, I cannot believe that it's leap day and will be March the 1st tomorrow. Adam, I know, and I don't like to pick on the age thing because I'm older than you all the time, but you it can is pick ridic- on me all you want to, TA. It's fine. It's okay. <laughs> it, is ri- it is ridiculous how, f- how fast this stuff flies. It seems so hectic, so busy and all that. And then you look up and it's almost over. Carolina with yep. three games left in the regular season. How did we get here, man? How did we get here so fast? Well, what did you say? Three games left in the regular season. So that means what's the most games they could have left? Twelve? Twelve. They played six yep. in the NCAA tournament and three in the ACC tournament. Yeah. So so they might not play 12, or they might. Um, but, yeah, man, good gosh. Yeah, what? It's going to be March at midnight, right? Like, you know, spring's coming. Um, you know, it's uh, – it's always wild when you when you are fortunate enough to cover a, a team that makes it deep and that makes it to the Final Four because you know when you when you get to the Final Four it's April you know spring training's in there it's opening day for Major League Baseball when you're you know at some far flung place um, so yeah I agree I agree that it's been flying we've covered how many games has UNC played twenty eight we've covered all twenty eight of these things it doesn't feel like we have um, but. Oh, look at there. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> it like is a amazing. Glass sound like, you know. <laughs> Technology, man. You know, if, if if they – the first page of any operator's manual needs to be unplug it, plug it back in, or turn it off, turn it back on. Yeah. <laughs> Works Absolutely. every time. But, yeah, to, to your point, Adam, and to the point we were talking about, they could play 12 games – they could have five games left, you know, if you if you go out early in these tournaments. It's just ridiculous how fast it actually flies. And in talking about that, and I think this is what we need to – we can start this show because we ask Armando Baycott every time, like, do you realize it's finally here? You know, the end is, the end is nigh. <laughs> and Jeremiah – Armando Baycott's played, what, 160 ball games for North Carolina? He has either he had either he has either five left or twelve left. Pretty incredible career that is that is coming to a close. Last time he could potentially play NC State in his Carolina career. It's just crazy how fast his career, this season, all this stuff flies by. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I I think when you just look at the uniqueness of his career, like when he comes in, UNC obviously has a. A difficult year, like one of the more difficult years in the history of that program. Then he plays on a team with, I guess, what ended up being three NBA players on it, uh, you know, as of today. Then he plays on a team that goes to national championship. So it's just been, you know, he's had such a unique career that, you know, yes, it does feel like he's been there for a long time. But like he was there in a in a strange time, like he played really like. He played a season where there was nobody in the stands. He played a season that got cut short. So for as long as he's been here and for as much as he's accomplished individually, this is the first time he's been on a team that, you know, from the start of the regular season to the end of the regular season, you look at them as a legitimate threat among the rest of the country. Like the team that went to championship was a bit of a surprise. And then last year's team was a surprise in the wrong way. So this is the first time he was on a team with expectations that met in the regular season or exceeded met or exceeded in the regular season, those, um, you know, expectations. So um, I think now, which I mean, it's, I mean, it's perfect timing because you know, that he's really uh, the type of player they need if they want to like kind of continue forward um, in March, like they need somebody, they need an interior presence, uh, you know, for as much perimeter skill as they have. They really need an interior presence uh, like Armando Baycott. So good timing, I guess, for him to have that uh, that COVID year come on a team where he fits pretty well into me. Um, and, yeah, like you said, like it's going to be – unless they face in the tournament, it's going to be his last time facing, you know, NC State 
Uh, I should have looked up his record in NC State. I think he only lost the one time last year, unless they lost in the 2020 year. Um, but pretty good record overall. So, uh, yeah, his, uh, yeah, lots to think about and a lot to reflect on for sure. Yeah, and, and so, Evan, I saved you for last because I'm going to give you the opportunity to just start up the quotes, and I'm going to use one. I like when we were talking to Mondo Baycott last week and – talking about the NIL stuff and I asked what his favorite was and he said me fine shout out to Joey Powell who's the director of me fine and he talked about why um, but right before that my favorite quote um, somebody over there on y'all's side said the money too he was like money's good too <laughs> I mean, not gonna lie the young man has made a, a nice living at North Carolina playing basketball. Don't blame him one second. I would stay until they did not allow me to stay anymore if I could do it. Um, but Evan, give me your quote of the week. Let's get this, this ball rolling here as Carolina eases into the state game on Saturday. Yeah, I'm going to start off with something Harrison Ingram said after the Miami game and kind of recapping just the – the hectic finish that it was toward the end of the game with UNC missing those five straight free throws all within like the last 24 seconds and grabbing all those offensive rebounds until uh, Jalen Withers hit his two free throws. And Harrison talking about that moment was like, I was like, come on, make a free throw. They were shooting free throws like they were me or something. It was a bad night that happens. And obviously Harrison is the worst free throw shooter of UNC's regular starters. I think he's, around 56, 57%, something like that. But when I was looking back, just how the game played out and even more so just like the box score, it the game mirrored so much of the Georgia Tech game in that against Georgia Tech, they shot, I think, 52% from the line as a team, which is the worst of the season. And then against Miami, they shot 57% from the line, which is the second worst of the season and the worst at home. And even crazier, I one thing that jumped off the page when I was looking at the box score was just Cormac and Harrison both shooting, I think it was 3 of 14 from the field, um, or sorry, 3 of 13 from the field against Miami. And when I saw 3 of 13 from the field, I was like, that sounds so familiar. So I went and checked the Georgia Tech box score, and they shot 3 of 14 from the field, both. So it, it was just a game in that, there were so many similarities. You know, you had Harrison Ingram and Cormac Ryan both shooting the exact same percentage from the field in those games and both shooting poorly. Uh, you had Armando Baycott, who was really quiet in both those games. He was four of eight from the field uh, against Georgia Tech. He was two of four against Miami. And then you had RJ Davis go off. Obviously, he had the 42 against Miami, and then I think he had 27, 28 against Georgia Tech. And when you look at it, I, the main difference between the Georgia Tech and the Miami game is R.J. Davis made a couple more shots against Miami than he against, did against Georgia Tech. I mean, point being is if R.J. Davis makes that floater, he's probably up to 30 points and they win that game against Georgia Tech. So they have shown the ability to win these games where R.J. can go off against teams that I would argue are nowhere near the tournament line, which I think is going to get pretty interesting uh, come tournament time because I don't know... <laughs> People might get mad at me, but I don't know if there's a game in the tournament that they're going to be able to win where Armando Baycott is a large non-factor, Cormac and Harrison are both inefficient, and you're relying on RJ to score 30+. plus. I don't know how many tournament teams are going to be able to, UNC is going to be able to be like that. Um, but I just thought it was pretty funny just looking at those two box scores and just how the game played out. It was pretty much identical, except that RJ Davis missed the last shot of the Georgia Tech game. And against Miami, he hit four straight threes and scored 15 of the last 17 points to close out that game. Get in here, Adam. I, I think it. there's some people in the chat talking about it. I, I think there's some cons, some serious concern going on here with things repeating itself. You, you talked about Georgia Tech and Miami comparisons, where there's four or five games, maybe six games now, where they've done nothing in the last five minutes um, and either held on or lost. And... That gets you a ticket home early in tournaments. Um, but anyway, Adam, go ahead. That's exactly what I was going to add very quickly so that we didn't get bogged down with it, was we're sitting there watching that game the other night, TA. Um, 
you know, together as we do, like a brotherhood, um, like a family. And the thought just, again, you're not trying to speak any evil into existence, but the thought occurs to you, you know, like this is how a night like Monday night is a night is how UNC goes home in like the first weekend of the tournament. You know, if something like that happens to where Cormac and, and Harrison Ingram cannot make a shot, they're struggling. You know, Mondo is neutralized to whatever degree. Um, you know, that's that just that's what occurs to you. Like this is the recipe for disaster. You know what I mean? But maybe you also saw, you know, like the Kimba Walker effect. You know, uh, Mick Cronin. I don't know if you guys saw the video the other day of. Uh, I wonder how he got on that subject. By the way, he's out there in Westwood and trying to trying to you know there UCLA has struggled obviously and. Uh, Somehow R.J. Davis comes up. It was interesting. If you guys, guys in the chat too, and guys and girls in the chat, if you haven't seen it, there's a clip of Crone, and it looks like he's just talking after practice. And somehow he got onto something saying like maybe somebody asked him who could be Kimball Walker, you know, that, that you know, the run that he went on in the postseason to carry UConn through, what, the Big East tournament just to get to the NCAA tournament. Uh, and he happens to say like, well, I don't want to put the pressure on him. Oh, okay, I'll say R.J. Davis, you know, you saw him go for 42 the other night. Um, so, yeah, like that, that you had that feeling. You had the feeling like this is how you could see it ending, which obviously UNC doesn't want it to end that way. Um, and also you see sort of maybe maybe the safety net they have because R.J. Davis is playing at a ACC Player of the Year first-team All-American level. So I just thought those were sort of maybe interesting um, – side notes to 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 the history that we watch RJ the historical run we watch RJ go on the other night um it'd be interested to see how it plays out and obviously UNC doesn't want that you know to happen but and, you know it's a thought that occurs yeah and Jeremiah I'm gonna get you in here about that and I want to get your quote as well I mean every tournament it, and I'm pretty sure except maybe Carolina and nine and there's probably one other Every single NCAA tournament, somebody got really lucky in in some round to survive. You can go back all the way to 95 because I felt like our, the Rashid Wallace Stackhouse team should have won that. Um, but they got a thigh bruise that cost them the game in the Final Four. But UCLA had to have a miracle finish to stay alive in that. They win the National Championship. When you look at this... And that's why I say it's concerning is because it keeps happening for North Carolina. It's not... Okay, Miami game was close, but they beat the heck out of whoever. This is like four or five times, like I mentioned. This is something that Hubert's got to get turned around. But Jeremiah, um, no need to speak it into existence as we're trying to do here, it sounds like. But uh, facts are facts. But your quote of the week? Yeah, so my quote of the week, I actually, uh, <clears throat> to, to set the scene, or not set the scene, to give some context a little bit, uh, in the midst of all this, uh, you know, Basketball season, we actually, uh, me and Adam, were at the Caden Football Center. We were talking to some of the uh, uh, the early enrollee freshmen, uh, you know, that UNC is going to have uh, next season. And so a lot of these guys, you know, people know their names. They haven't seen them, obviously, on the college level, the ACC level. But talking to them is still pretty fun, honestly, you know, just kind of getting their personalities a little bit um, and, and, and things like that. So my quote of the week. I just thought it was pretty funny from uh, Curtis Simpson, who is uh, out of Kings Mountain defensive end. He actually won uh, defensive player of the year in the Big South 3A uh, level. So we're talking to him. Adam's doing the video and uh, and I'm over there. And this is toward like the end of when he's talking. So it's just kind of like, you know, I throw it out this question. Uh, we get like these like facts, like these bios on these guys. And in his bio, I saw that, you know, he also played basketball. Uh, so, you know, me liking basketball and all of us in this chat liking basketball, uh, I asked him about it. So I'm like, so I see that you play basketball. Like, what's your what's your game like? And so with no hesitation, I wrote down the quote, but I got to like say it kind of how he said it, because he had so much like confidence when he was saying it. So with no hesitation, he's like. Oh, I'm a straight bucket. I'm giving buckets. I'm giving everybody 30. Like, let's go. I'm giving everybody 30. Then he immediately backtracks and he says, nah, like all jokes aside, I'm really just a rebounder. I'm more of a defensive player. 
I can give you maybe like 10 points a game, you know, playing basketball, I'm more of a defensive player. And so just that immediate switch. And then Adam, uh, right after, had a quote just as good. That's like, so you basically just went from Kevin Durant to Dennis Rodman, like in two seconds. And so we're like, uh, you know, it's always funny. The reason, part of the reason I picked that quote is because if you talk to everybody, anybody really on that team, they all can give you 40. Like everybody on that team it thinks they're like really good. Now I haven't seen a lot of those guys like play. And some of them did play in high school, but everybody like on the current UNC team, or at least a lot of them uh, really think they can play basketball. I really think they can, you know, kind of hang. And some of them, I will say their teammates will vouch for and say that they can hoop a little bit. Um, but I always, so I thought that was funny. Just like the, just the immediate confidence and then somehow just switching himself back to reality. Like I probably would have just stuck with the, with the 30 and, you know, I probably would have just had people thinking I was AI and just like, you know, let it ride from there. Uh, but that's my, that's my quote of the week just for pure, like, and I told him, I said, I said exactly what I just said to y'all that like a lot of, uh, a lot of guys on that team thinking hoop. And he basically just said like, you know, they got a CB as well. So he said it in jest, but I thought it was, I thought it was very funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you go to intramurals. I remember back in the day when, when I was at school, you did you wanted nothing of those football dudes in intramurals <laughs> because not only can they play, they will beat you to death doing it. And, uh, you know, we've talked about Drake May a lot. And, and since he's no longer at Carolina, he played a ton of intramural ball. Yeah. And he took nothing off of anybody out there. And, oh, uh, I don't I don't know if I told this on here. Adam knows this. I told him this. Uh, my senior year, I actually played against Drake in an intramural game. It was a, a – it was a playoff game, and we actually – his brother, uh, Bo May, he actually came late. So we played – we started off playing, like, five on four, and we were winning, like, by ten. And then Bo May gets there, and, like, we just cannot get a rebound. So we end up losing the game. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I actually did play against Drake, and uh, that was, like, my last intramural game that I played was against them. Dude could play, and he was very, very – and still is very competitive. Uh, I mean, yeah. he busts what people. What did he do in the game, Jeremiah? What I mean, tell us what Drake did. Did he do yeah, anything, or was he just did he, did running he three point line, three point line? I ain't gonna lie, man. He settled for a lot of threes. You know, he, it, it, <laughs> wasn't, it wasn't a ton of. Now, like you know, I'm not ragging on him because you know he's not trying to like get injured or nothing like that. Right, he's trying uh, not to get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, not trying not to get in trouble. He, he ain't driving on us too much or anything. So he kind of you know self for threes. You know. Didn't make it, you know. He didn't. He didn't light us up necessarily. Um, you know, uh, I played pretty well. I'm not gonna lie, but <laughs> I didn't play well enough for us to win. But you know, it was, you know, I I, I had a little bit, but nah. Uh, <laughs> Listen, I you, bet, just go. How many did you score? I know you're one of the. You sound like. Oh no! <laughs> I just knocked him off. I did that. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, <You ran> <laughs> <off>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah, I ain't gonna lie. Like, how many right. did you go up to the book and be like, how many did I get on the book? <laughs> I, I did actually keep my points. Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> there I, can, it is. You know, I know how much I score. You know what I mean? What did you score? Come on. I had 15. It wasn't nothing crazy. Oh, okay. But I don't know how many Drake had. I didn't really count. Uh, but I feel like Bo uh, probably had the most on that team, though. You know, I've, probably... I've, I've heard stories um, that from sources I trust more than anybody in the world that Drake and those football players – just wreck people and the best games are when it's frat boys versus the football guys. Oh, <laughs> it wasn't the nineties too. I can tell you that. Uh -huh, yeah. And it was the same way. Ooh. And it was like, if you played on court one, you better bring it. I remember I was playing against somebody and thank God he was nice. And I got a rebound and I came down and I split the dude's head open. And I was like, I'm going to get killed right here. Cause he's going to be so pissed that it did. He was just like, no, it's part of the game. He's got a gash over there. That was my one experience on court one in there um, <laughs> before I, I realized. Yeah, you know, you don't get in my circle. You know, the <laughs> cylinder, whatever they call it. Mm -mm, I learned that early on. But anyway, let's move it along. Adam, did you give a quote or do you want to go to a story? Because I have a feeling um, I want to hear stories, but I'll leave it up to you. I have Order a story. Quote. I have a okay. quote. Um, I can, I can segue into a story. I can do anything, you know, I can do anything you want me to do, baby. Uh, I was scrolling through the chat here when the, the young, the young guns were telling their quotes and I, I shuddered when I saw, uh, 
Sean Crawley mentioned uh, 2005 and the Villanova UNC game in the Sweet 16 at Syracuse. Oh my goodness! I was telling Jeremiah about that when we were up there a couple weeks ago. Like that was a game UNC really thought about losing. Uh, if you guys remember that, Randy Foy and Alan Ray in that Syracuse—I mean, in that Villanova backcourt. Kyle Lowry. You know, Why I mean. On that? Uh, I don't know if Lowry was on that team. I think it was Randy Foy and Alan Ray. He might Kyle Lowry might. I think Kyle Lowry was later. I think I'm looking at why you're talking. UNC blew out in 2009 in the Final Four. You might I don't be right. Know. It runs anyway, the Carolina got run. very beneficial call in that five game. Remember yes. the walk, no walk, and I was Melvin there. Scott. I was there. It was a late game. NC State and Wisconsin had played the early game. Um. You know, it looked like we're going to have an NC State UNC regional final to go to the final four. Um, and yeah, you th the whistle blows, you think it's going to be an and one for Nova, and it ends up being a walk. <laughs> uh, Carolina got a great whistle that night. Anyway, I did shudder on that, but I'll uh, I'll hush my mouth. Let me go to my quote. Um, no, before you do that, Lowry played on that game. It he was, was Lowry. in a game? Yep. 05-06. Uh, 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 04-05 was his freshman year. 05-06 was his sophomore year, and then he went to the league. Were Randy Foy and Alan Ray on that team, or did I dream that up? I think Tell like quote, and I'll look it up. Okay. Um, all right. I know Randy Foy was on that team, because I remember him giving mm -hmm. people a lot of problems. Um, okay, I'm going to go to one Cormac Ryan, uh, and we're going to take a little bit of a trip back in time to Saturday's UNC win at uh, UVA, which everyone knows was a big deal because Carolina had lost eight straight games there um, in Charlottesville, Ooville. And so this is Cormac Ryan, who, if you'll remember, he's hit six three-pointers in that game, five of them in the first half. Uh, quite frankly, he was UNC's offense in the first half. R.J. Davis did not score. Armando Baycott got in foul trouble, left at the 12-minute mark. Um, but Cormac Ryan hit five threes in the first half and pretty much carried them until the second half until, you know, they were able to get some more contributions. So what I want you to listen to is where he starts this answer and where he ends up because Cormac has gotten asked for good reason throughout the year about his shooting. And when he has had games like he had against UVA, which by the way, was like his third or fourth straight game of really uh, pretty good shooting. You know, has he sort of gotten a monkey off his back? The, you know, and the, the my point here is Cormac does not like talking about his shooting. He just really doesn't. He has not ever bitten anyone's head off or say to me, like, shut up, Baldy, you know. Um, but he, you could just tell it's not a subject he likes to sort of dwell on. Um, so he went, I think it was six for 11. Yes, yeah, six for 11 from three at UVA. You talk about a big game in a big spot. And the question was asked of him was, was that the best you felt shooting since he had a game a couple of NCAA tournaments ago with Notre Dame where he scored 29 points and Notre Dame beat Alabama. He went crazy in that game. Uh, it was, you know, sort of his career game. Um, so the question was, was that as good as you felt uh, in that Alabama game a couple of NCAA tournaments ago, ago? First thing he says is, um, it was definitely one of the better first half feelings that I've had. It's always good when you get to see a couple in a row go down and kind of get rolling, especially against a team like Virginia on the road in a big game. So he starts sort of not talking about himself. We knew we needed this, and so I think everybody kind of had that different gear in them tonight, just a different will and want to, to make sure that we were making plays and really digging in, doing the things that we practiced all week to get this win because we knew how much we wanted it and needed it. So that's the Cormac quote. He's asked about his shooting, and he ends up talking about the entire team doing what they did in practice, try to get the W. Um, I just, I feel like it's sort of illustrative of a Cormac type of answer this year. He really does not want to dig into the shot. As we know, he's shooting at a career low from, from three point range until a couple of games ago, I added it up. He had a four game run where he hit 16 threes. He was 16 for 32 from three. Um, coming out of the UVA win for UNC. What did he do Monday night? This is why he doesn't like talking about it. He went one for nine from three. So you got that four-game run of really what UNC, that's what they want. That's what they need out of Cormac. Sandwiched around 
an 0 for 6 from 3 against Clemson, and a 1 for 9 from 3 against Miami. Again, this is why Cormac doesn't like talking about it because he's smart enough to know that next 1 for 9 or 0 for 6 could be coming even when he goes six for 11, even when he goes four for seven against Virginia Tech, even when he goes four for nine against Syracuse, the next one could be coming. And, you know, watch the video. A lot of people have watched the video. I went back and watched. I think it's over 3,000 people have watched him after UVA. Um, You know, you can tell he's he's smart enough to sort of like, yeah, I'll answer that just a little bit, and I'll play a little shell game with you, and look where we ended up. We ended up way over here. Um, So that's what I had, the Cormac quote after UVA. I love the uh, the guys that are experienced. They know how to kind of they, they'll give you enough to satisfy you at in the moment, but they don't really tell you what you really wanted to know. Um, it's masterful. By coaches do it, players, older players do it. I'm gonna take a break and I'm gonna talk about Johnny T-shirt, but we're gonna talk about 2005 Villanova. Alan Ray, Randy Foy, Curtis Sumter. Jason Frazier, folks that follow North Carolina recruiting certainly know who Frazier and Sumter are. Kyle Lowry was also on that team, and then Mike Nardi uh, was as well. But you're right, Adam. Uh, Alan Ray was the leader of that team. That was that moment. That was the 2005 team's moment. That was the Baylor moment. That was the, you know, I guess the LSU moment, if that can be considered one in 09. Arkansas uh, in 2017. You yeah, know, just round of 32. We got those got ones you got to figure it out. Yep. It is, uh, it is, it is every tournament run I've ever seen, except maybe 2009. The LSU game is questionable, the toe game. But anyway, Johnny T shirt, Johnny T shirt.com sponsors of this podcast. You can go there and you can get any swag you need. If you're in Chapel Hill on Saturday for the NC State game, you need to go by and see Johnny T shirt. You can go by there, get on Franklin Street, visit them. But also spend your money there, spend your hard-earned money there, and then you uh, can get your ten percent off if you're an Inside Carolina Premium subscriber. Take care of them; they take care of us. They are the reason we're here. They're one of the reasons we're here. They're sponsors, and they uh, there's a reason they've lasted on Franklin Street. When if you're old school and you walk down Franklin Street and nothing looks the same, but Johnny T-shirt's still there, it's because they're good. They treat people right, and they've got great product and great customer service. Go visit them and take care of them. National Guys Pay the Bills is on the beat live, stretch run. We'll come back with more stories. Okay, guys, we're back. It's on the beat. Johnny T-shirt, second half of the show, sponsored by Congruity. Jeremiah, I'm going to get you in here first on a story. Uh, I'm watching this chat, the live chat go through, and I see some some interesting stuff in there, but maybe we'll talk about it at the end. Jeremiah, give me a story from your week. You've had a busy one. Last week you weren't here. You covered NC State and North Carolina women's game. Um, So a lot to choose from. Give us a story. Yeah, I'm going to choose one from, uh, you know, this past Monday. So we did touch on R.J. Davis's uh, 42-point game, but just to kind of put it in perspective so steve kirshner who you know obviously is the you know sid for the uh for the basketball team uh so stat guy has stats on stats uh after hubert davis's press conference usually steve does give us you know uh you know some nuggets and and things like that but he reeled off and i actually had to record it just to make sure i caught it all he usually sends him out but i just kind of like to you know just have him so i just so i just have him um It was a when I went back to my order, it was about a two minute, 15 second, like just just string of just stats. And the reason I found it so interesting and I'm not I'm going to try not to read every single one because I don't want to bore y'all. But the reason I found it so interesting, because it's so many eras of like UNC basketball in these facts that he gives. So here are the facts that he gives. So RJ's 42 points, 10th most ever in a game by a UNC player. Obviously, most in the Smith Center, as we know, and he broke Hans Bro's record in 06. Um, he actually had the most points by any UNC player since Shamad Williams in 1998, which was a double overtime game. Then he had the most threes since Cole Anthony in 2020, which was at Syracuse. And another one that was actually kind of funny, I, I wouldn't have really thought about this. He had 56% of the points, and then the only player that's had more was George Glamick in 1941, who had 59% of the points. So we've gone already 40s and 90s, 2000s, 2020s, 
Uh, first time UNC ever won a game. I'm sorry, first time UNC won a game with one double-digit score since uh, Tyler Zeller, 2011. And then I'll give you one more uh, largest scoring gap between the leading scorer and the second leading scorer since Lenny Rosenbluth and Pete Brennan in, oh, man, I forgot to write the date down. Uh, so I guess this Rosenbluth would have been uh, 50s, I believe, um, if I had that correct. So in that game, it was Rosenbluth had 45, and a guy named Pete Brennan had 12. And then obviously the other day it was RJ's 42 and Harrison Ingram's eight. Uh, so the reason I, I picked that is just because, I mean, that's just that ranges almost every, like, you know, decade. And we're just sitting there, like, I mean, it just puts it in all perspective, like, we're really sitting there watching a historic performance. Like, you you know, you go into these games, you cover these games, you never really know what's going to happen necessarily. Like, obviously, you're thinking about, you know, it's the ACC race and they're trying to lock up number one. R.J. Davis obviously is in the middle of an All-American season. But when you see games like that, it really just reminds you of, like, what you're really watching. Like, you're watching the player having a special type of season. Like, you look at, you know, some of those – you know, jerseys that are, you know, honored in the standings. I know we talked a couple weeks ago about, you know, amending some of the criteria for Armando and, and things like that. But then when you really think about it, like, RJ is going to end up in the rap because he's going to, you know, like if he wins player of the year, that's automatic. And then if he goes first or second team, All-American is automatic. So, yeah, I mean, starting this year, you know, there was a lot of, you know, unknowns, uncertainty. I knew RJ would lead the team in scoring, obviously. But I think the extent to which he's playing – you know, better than 21 points a game. He's had three 30 plus point games, um, you know. And so I think just, you know, hearing. And, oh, and also, I, I don't think I said he tied. Uh, he's tied for 10th all time now in scoring. I guess everybody knows that at this point with Brad Doherty. So he's tied, which is great. I don't know. For, for some reason, for me, like, you know, that's that's crazy to think about. Like, you know, everybody I've seen play at UNC, even for an exper extended period of time. And R.J. Davis is 10th on that list. Um, and I guess he's about to, you know, end up at night the next time he plays. So, um, yeah, I think the other night just really put into perspective to me, just like what we've really been able to, to watch this year. Definitely seen some greatness. You know, I got a question and I guarantee I would be shocked if you two know it, Jeremiah or Evan, Adam, what is George Glamick's nickname? Don't look it up. George the Iceman Glamick. Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> he, was, he played in the 40s, right? Yeah, 40 and 41. Willen? He would have had to, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. I guess it was Willen then, yeah. Well, it gives me an opportunity to talk Educate about Educate us, baby. Yeah. Ooh. Somebody in the chat mentioned this. This is volume two of the Tar Heel book. I had, Greg and I did a podcast with Ron Smith, the author of the Tar Heels and the history of North Carolina basketball. The most comprehensive thing but yes people in the chat they obviously it. know the blind bomber he was so nearsighted that he based on where he shot and how hard he shot where he was on the floor <laughs> and he was an all-american um so think about that and then to your point jeremiah when when kirsch mentioned his name i was like good gracious man we're going back a long time this is how impressive rj's uh, performances have been and we're not going to hear somebody talk about the asterisks. You guys are at the games. You don't hear the, the TV people talking about constantly about Baycott's asterisks. Corey Alexander, man. I'm going to start calling him Corey the Asterisk Alexander because he mentions it literally every time he talks about Armando Baycott. Anyway, I have volume one of the Tar Heel book down below me too as well. It's heavy. People need to check those out. If you're a Carolina basketball fan, there's nothing better um, than those books on that history stuff that RJ is now writing his name into. Evan, you're up. Story. Yeah, just really quick on RJ lastly. In a world where Zach E isn't playing college basketball right now, there's a possibility that RJ could have his would have had his jersey retired, if I'm not mistaken. Because I think if you get National Player of the Year, Overall, that gives you the eligibility yes, to get it retired. Yeah. Um, and I would argue, outside of ED, I'm, let's say RJ and Dalton Connect are kind of that 2-3 in that next tier. Um, it's just crazy to think about. I mean, RJ could have had the possibility to be the last player to ever wear number four at UNC. Um, but my and, story... And I mean, I, hold on. I don't 
I think he has to be consensus national play of the year. Um, so like if is? Edie won, yeah, it, if Edie wins all the big ones and RJ wins, like Stackhouse won Sports Illustrated player of the year back in 95, but his jersey's not retired because it's not quote unquote consensus. So uh, he could was, theoretically, was, yeah. go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I was looking at it the other day, there's a certain player of the years that count. So it's like yeah. Oscar Robertson, Wooden, uh, AP, there's a few of them. So I don't know the Sports Illustrated would. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it, it's it's probably it's, it's like six of them, maybe five or six of them. Where yeah, it's like if you get that the one, saying, consensus. If he's consensus national player of the year, um, but what Evan is saying, TA is in a world where Zach Eady is not no longer in college. See what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, you know, don't get me started on Eady. I mean, he's taller than he's bigger than everybody. He's like playing four. on. Somebody said he's playing on a Fisher Price goal. You think about what he's doing versus what RJ's doing. I mean, you've got like Muggsy Bogues compared to Minute Bowl size <laughs> players out there. And I just think RJ's more impressive. Now, Dalton Connect is, he's the bucket too now. But Edie, my hot take is uh, Purdue doesn't make it out of the second weekend um, and maybe not out of the first weekend. Anyway, go ahead, Evan. Don't get me on hot takes in the tournament. Adam Adam knows mine, but I'm a, I'm going to leave that for a couple more weeks. We need to hear that actually because this uh, this oh, I'll save it for the end. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's save it before the NCAA tournament starts because yeah, yeah. Evan could be in a situation where he could gloat for the rest of his young life if this was to happen. Um which I don't right. think it, I personally don't think is going to happen. I uh I I would not I feel the exact opposite Evan does on this, but anyway, uh, go you ahead. can put your money where your mouth is too, Evan. You know, now in North Carolina, you can start in <laughs> March 11th. You can absolutely put it on there. Tell us your story, man. We're going to be here until midnight if we don't get it rolling. <laughs> so I was just going to kind of dive into the whole Virginia game, and I was lucky enough to travel up there and kind of saw the reaction on social media of how painful it was to watch it on TV, just the style of the game it was. And I can confidently say it was probably twice as painful to watch in person at times. Um, it was pretty funny. There was a moment midway to the latter half of the first half when Virginia is at the line shooting free throws. And they make both of them. And after each make, it sounds like Virginia just had this monster dunk or just drilled like their third three-pointer in a row. I mean, the crowd is going crazy off free throws and that was kind of just indicative of how that whole game was i mean it was a clunker 54 44 to make matters worse uh after we finished covering that game and when we went out to eat dinner at bj's um just a local restaurant in charlottesville the game that we had the chance to watch was southern cal in, in ucla and it was a 60 something to 56 kind of game. I mean, it was basically we, we had the opportunity to watch four hours of, of very ugly basketball on Saturday. Uh, it was very painful. So when I got back to my hotel room after dinner that night, uh, finished little part of my story. And I'm the kind of person that after I finish a story or, or working a game, I just can't go straight to bed. I usually either read something or watch something of, national sports relevance just to kind of feel educated on on teams outside of North Carolina and I was kind of joking throughout the day that after watching the type of basketball that I had experienced for four hours I was going to need some kind of offensive cleanse so luckily I got to watch the Kentucky Alabama game and I actually watched like a condensed like 30 minute version of it and obviously that game was a, a 117 to 95 win for Kentucky at home where there was just offense flying all over the place. Um, so just kind of that whole whole day in itself and watching, you know, a Virginia team that didn't score over 50 for the third straight game. It's still crazy to me that that team has, what, 21 wins now? I mean, I, I know Hubert Davis is probably the runaway for coach of the year in the ACC, maybe Steve Forbes, but that probably died down after last night. But um, the fact that that Virginia team has 21 wins and, is probably going to be in the NCAA tournament is insane. I mean, that roster, just looking at the the pieces, is just it's not very good. It, it's probably the worst, if not one of, if not the worst, uh, rosters that Bennett has had at Virginia. 
Um, but just overall, just the whole day of, of watching uh, offense was definitely optional in the games that we had the chance to watch, and it, it kind of was just a funny day as a whole. Yeah, I mean, UVA, beautiful campus, or excuse me, grounds. Um, they don't call it campus up there. Do not do that. They will correct you 100%. Um, what is it? Bodos Bagels over there next to campus. Cool place to eat. Um, but the basketball team. I don't know if it speaks to how good a coach Tony Bennett is or does it fit the national narrative that the ACC is not any good. Um, There's somewhere in between there, I think. But Virginia just I, – I tweeted it, and I thought it was a great tweet. I come up with some good stuff sometimes. But it said, uh, it said Virginia wants to drag you into the abyss with them and, and beat you in the abyss, and that's the way they play. But God knows – I'm just thankful that it wasn't a drinking contest game watching that Virginia Carolina game as bad as it was, because if it was like miss three pointer drink or, or miss layup drink, it's going to be a long day. Anyway, where are we? See, y'all get me thinking about other things. I can't keep up. We are 41 minutes in. How much more we got? Adam, you want to tell us your story, your, your, uh, your story, or do we want Jeremiah to close the show? What do we want to do? I could tell a story. It's not really a story. It was kind of um, an observation, maybe. Um, I've been enjoying the the people in the chat too. I've just it's just enjoyable to scroll scroll through here. And uh, M Barnes talking about connect. You know, it's funny when, after UNC beat Tennessee in that ACC SEC Challenge game, one hundred to ninety two. Uh, Armando just randomly says, and Armando's calling him necked, like he can't, he's not pronouncing connect correctly. <laughs> He's just like, yeah, we almost got neck too. Could you imagine that? And I'm thinking like, damn, that would be. I don't know if I can imagine that, Armando. You know, it was kind of funny just him calling him neck. It was pretty ridiculous. But um, the one I don't know anecdote that I would have. Well, I have a bunch, but this is the one I'm going to give you. Um, it's not the. It's not of the level of uh, me and Evan's adventure with the uh, Virginia Tech Karen and uh, T Nick pursuit uh, last week, but. Um, Jeremiah, it, you missed that. You mentioned he lived beat. It. I did. <laughs> I know about it. I went back and watched it. Yeah, but I do know about it. Yeah. <laughs> VT Karen. Anyway. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe we'll see her again. Maybe we'll see her in DC. Uh, God can only hope. I'll give her one single rose and a kiss on the cheek. Uh, she's gonna cuss you if she's right. there. I mean, she's big enough to beat me up. Let's be honest. I mean, um, Garrett Clem is just buttering me up. You know, I'm a sucker for those compliments. Uh, but w- what I was going to say was, so obviously UNC played it at UVA on Saturday. My thing what my thing is about John Paul Jones Arena, JPJ, they call it, the locals call it. Uh, when I go up there and it's been very revel- relevant at inside Carolina here lately, um, I cannot help but think or wonder what UNC fans, maybe some of the people are, our people in the chat can tell us what they would think if UNC built an arena that size, um, because it's still, it was built, I believe it was 2006. I was looking it up. It still feels new. Uh, even though it's what 18, almost 20 years old now, it is 14,000, I think 14,500, you know, that is a really nice arena. Uh, and I, I feel like it gives you everything you might need. Uh, obviously the Dean dome is 21, 570. Um, but I mean, if you think I just I, I I find myself when I go up there imagining what it would be like if UNC had that. Can you imagine like the suites? They have a suite level where you can get in there and you've got a great sight line. Um, can you imagine what the suite level would go for at UNC basketball? Um, the arena that size? I mean, I it would it would take a whole lot of working out with the with the PSL, the public seat licenses um but i can tell you for a fact uh maybe i'm breaking some news here i can tell you for a fact that if bubba cunningham was the only person deciding this that he would build a new arena and it would be about fourteen thousand to sixteen thousand seats i can tell you that for a fact um that's a true fact and i can tell you that if he was going to build a new arena that it's 14,000 to 16,000. There would be a certain faction of people who would disagree because they'd say, no, we need to have 20,000 because it's all about the number and the size 
You can make some mm-hmm. size jokes there if you want to. But, um, you know, it's it's a thought that I – UNC has played at UVA a lot. I think the, the schedule just came out for uh, – the team pairings just came out for next year. I th- Jeremiah wrote the story. I don't think they play at UVA next year. Is that right, Jeremiah? They don't go up there, right? Or maybe they do. I could have – don't believe I so. i got to uh, double check. Read it that. wrong. But, um, yeah, they don't. Yeah, They're just right. playing at home. Okay. But, you know, UNC has played up there a lot, and it's just the thought that I, I I just feel like the, you know, we were talking to, but as we were packing up, we were talking to one of the, um, you know, assistant ADs at Virginia, and he was saying the same thing that I had sort of got him on that sweet thing. Like, he's like, oh, my God, if UNC had sweets, my Lord, think about what those things would go for. Um, and, you know, you'd have to pony up some money to get a sweet at a UNC home basketball game. Um, but, you know, I know that obviously, you know, we've had the story. Greg Barnes uh, wrote the story. I did some of the interviews for the story. Um, you know, the, where they looked at Thompson Bowling Arena at Tennessee uh, as sort of a model of maybe this is how we renovate the Dean Dome because they're both the same size, Thompson Bowling and the Dean Dome. But, um I don't know why people, how people would feel about it if you if you downsized maybe seven thousand seats, five thousand seats. I can tell you from being there. I don't know. Maybe I've been there ten times. Maybe I don't know. I'm. I, I, I should add it up, but I mean, it's a dang nice place to to see a game. Um, and they always fill it up. You know, we, we Jeremiah and I have joked with each other that everywhere UNC has played this basketball season. Well, there's Pitt, Georgia Tech, NC State, uh, you know, Syracuse, Miami. Uh, there has been at some point in the second half a very audible Tar Heels chant. Tar Heels in, you know, these far flung places and in Raleigh. You've heard them do it, but they didn't do it at UVA because there was all UVA fans. Um, there, there was no Tar Heels chant they got up that day. Um, so it's just a thought I had. I, I was thinking about it. We were walking out, we were walking sort of diagonally across the court and you look up and uh after you've been in the dean dome a lot of times you think well 14,000 seats it's kind of a small arena but you know it's it has both the feel of a big place and a and an intimate place i think uh just the way it's constructed um you know it would be interesting i don't know how people would think about it or feel about it but it's just a thought that i have when i go up there what would this be like if this was if this was the place unc played at a lot of decisions are going to have to be made at some point um, uh, about it. You know, who knows? The Dean Dome is 40 years old almost. It's incredible. I remember, I tell my story. We were going to the Duke, North Carolina football game in November of 85, I think it was. And we used to park in the 54 lot. And we would walk down Raleigh Road, take a left at Carmichael, Walk through Carmichael to get to, you know, then you walk by the pool back there and you can't really do it now. But anyway, to get the thing, but you want to use the bathroom before you go to Kansas Stadium. We walk in, this is November of 85. The Dean Dome was supposed to open against UCLA that year, that that weekend. Um, but it, it was delayed or whatever and obviously opened against Duke and we know that history in 86. But anyway, we're walking through. I turned the corner. I'm with my parents, my brother. We turned the corner, and there stands Dean Smith and Michael Jordan on crutches outside of Dean's office, which at the time was on the bottom floor of Carmichael around the back. And I'm being, I'm, I'm what, a 14-year-old kid, and this is Michael Jordan standing in front of us. I talked to Dean, talked to both of them. Dean says, come in my office, you know, signs me his autograph. And he says, you, you make sure you get Michael now. And then he steps out and he tells Michael, whatever, greatest thing ever. If the Smith Center had been open on time, maybe that never happens. And maybe we don't get that experience with Dean and Michael Jordan right there. But that was almost 40 years ago. It is amazing to me how old that building is now and other than getting rid of some of the booths at the top, they haven't done much much to it since then, and uh, something's got to be done at some point. Anyway, we got it's 10 all minutes. steel and concrete in there, TA. Like this, it's, I know it's probably it's probably 
a billion pounds of concrete and steel the way they build that thing i mean it's in ridiculous. terms of like renovating it um and i agree i was i was reading through the chat like my guy 828 lawson here was talking about you know it is freaking awesome when you're in the dean dome the place is packed and those banners are swaying i mean i i'm not meaning to crap on the dean dome at all um i'm just sort of giving you a here's where we're at um but but what i was what i interrupted you i'm sorry for stepping on your feet but um mm -hmm. it's all steel and concrete it, it we we've been told that you you really cannot or they don't think they can renovate part of it while still you know we're going to do this part and keep playing a season they don't think they can do that because again all steel and concrete in there i mean that thing is a huge slab of sturdy stuff i mean so it's not like you could just say well we'll just work on this while we play the season i don't apparently they can't do that yeah it is, it is literally like a bunker built into the side of a of a hill over there all right, we got 10 minutes left in this show. I want to get you guys, y'all's take on NC State. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to talk NC State, Notre Dame, and then we'll talk about Duke next week. Uh, I, I kind of phrased it, rivalry, senior night, rivalry. Three straight games for this team. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a week for these young men, this coaching staff and this team and this program, having them mixed up like that, uh, you know, so NC State on Saturday, they come into the Smith Center wanting some get back. They uh, Carolina beat them good. They always beat them good in, in PNC, as somebody in the chat said, Marcus Page Arena. Um, but Evan, you can start first. Carolina's keys to beating NC State, um, real quick, two minutes apiece. Uh, I think just kind of contain DJ Horn. I mean, to beat. Brutally honest, no one outside of DJ Horn on NC State's team, I think, is all too much of a threat. Uh, I think Adam had talked to me and Jeremiah about it the other night when State went on the road and lost at Florida State. DJ Burns played 12 minutes and scored zero points. Um, he's been exposed on the defensive end. He's been exposed with teams who like to run a lot, which UNC likes to. And I think that could be a issue for NC State on Saturday. And then for the UNC perspective, it was kind of something I was thinking about this in just the last couple of days. They have shown a way to win games in different ways. They've shown the ability to win when RJ Davis goes off, when Armando Baycott goes off, when Cormac or Harrison might go off. They've won games where they scored 100 points and they've won games where they've scored 60. And I don't know if that's good or not. It's kind of an interesting part of this team where it's good in that maybe they are prepared to win any kind of game possible, but it's also bad in that they don't necessarily have a, a certain identity that I think anyone can count on going into a game. Like, I don't think anyone is going into a game saying UNC is going to definitely score over 80 points or UNC is going to hold their opponent under 60. So I think that's something that UNC is going to have to get figured out because come tournament time, I do think they're going to have to have some solidified identity if they want to go far. And I think that starts with the NC State game. You can kind of formulate your identity throughout these last three games of the regular season leading into the postseason. And I think it there's really no better game to kind of start that off than against a rival. Adam, I'm going to let you go. But first, I'm on, I said this last segment was sponsored by Congruity. I'm going to do this right fast since we got 220 folks in the chat. And shout out to everybody to join us. I mean, the post-game lives, this crew here is working their butts off in the bowels of the Smith Center. We're doing post-game podcasts sitting in the comfort of our home with six, seven, eight hundred 800 people. Um, pretty incredible. And just so folks will know, we're doing VIP and myself Saturday after NC State. Maybe Dewey joins us. He'll be in the Smith Center. We'll see how that goes. Um, but a, a great turnout, as always, to you guys. And Congruity is another part of our, our deal. CongruityHR.com, front slash Tar Heels. Get your mid to, small to mid-sized business assessment. They'll offer you what they can do for you to make your business grow. You can take it or leave it, but it's free if you're an inside Carolina person. So take advantage. Congruity HR dot com front slash tar heels get a free assessment great customer service all the latest technology darren and matt and those guys they did it for themselves they can do it for you as well adam i'm gonna let you go up and close us out with nc state and then i'm gonna get jeremiah's comments and then we're getting out of here 
T.A., what did you say? NC State will be looking for a little get back on the Tar Heels, I believe yeah. you said. They, they they want some get back. I I've heard uh, some chatter that from from the uh, negative Nellies or the nervous Nellies that NC State is going to come in spoiling for a fight and gonna gonna get get back on Carolina. I don't well, see. I'm it here happening. to tell you. I'm here to tell you from Mebane, North Carolina. It ain't gonna happen. Uh, they that is not happening. UNC is gonna beat that Fanny on Saturday. Um, I'm not a big believer in NC State. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what's going to happen. UNC is going to win the game 91-75 to 75 on Saturday afternoon in the Dean e. Smith Center. That's what's going to happen. And after the UNC wins that game against Kevin Keats and the boys, do you know what UNC's home record will be against uh, NC State uh, in sort of just a recent span? They will improve to 19-2 and two against NC State and Chapel Hill. They, the last 20 times NC State has visited – UNC. <laughs> Carolina's won 18 of them. Uh, matter of fact, the two games they've lost, uh, Carolina, both have been in overtime. Carolina owns NC State and Chapel Hill. The ownership is going to continue. If you look back to the days when Roy got here, as I see my guy Mark Williams mentioning, Carolina is 37 and 6 against NC State in the last 43 meetings. They are not losing to the Wolfpack on Saturday. Uh, Evan brought it up. We were talking, me and Evan and Jeremiah were talking about it. Where the hell, what the hell, where is DJ Burns gone? Like, I mean, I'll be interested to see what Hubert says. We might have to correct him tomorrow. We always talk to Hubert on Friday afternoons. He loves to talk about DJ Burns like he's freaking Zach Randolph, you know, like, or <laughs> Jokic with his passing. I mean, DJ Burns is a non factor over there. The guy cannot get up and down the court, he simply cannot run. I mean, they're playing FSU the other night, and you know what an end-to-end game that is with FSU pressing? They, they, they played the guy 12 minutes. He had zero points and zero rebounds. And then afterwards, if you hear what Leonard Hamilton said, they basically called him fat. Um, you know, he was saying, like, I'm not sure what scales they're using at NC State, but he's not 270 is what Leonard said. Um, so anyway, yes, I agree. DJ Horn, DJ Horn can go for 30. He can go for 35 on anyone. You know, that game that NC State played against Syracuse recently, that was super entertaining. With Chris Bell going crazy. Uh, uh, the, the dude Copeland, he's got a name that starts with Q for Syracuse. DJ Horn went nuts. Um, but, yeah, I see UNC winning this thing. The NC State sort of has the inverse of what Carolina has. Carolina has, has, starting with Miami the other night, three of their final four games at home. NC State has three of their final four games on the road. The one home game they have is the Duke Blue Devils. I think the Wolfpack's looking at a four-game losing streak to take into the ACC tournament. They lost to the FSU the other night. They're going to lose to Carolina on Saturday. Then they have Duke at home, and they go to Pitt next week. I don't know if they're going to win any of these games. Um, so that would be uh, that would be my uh, hot take-ish uh, comment there, T.A. I, I, I got 91-75, and I got – Carolina extending the dominance uh, against the Wolfpack. It's going to be – I should have looked it up. I think it will be seven or eight weeks since these teams played in Raleigh. Remember, it was like the third or fourth conference mm -hmm. game of the season, early January when they played. Um, so, that's what I've got. Adam, coming in hot, you mentioned Leonard Hamilton. Love that guy. I want whatever fountain of youth he's got. He's been coaching since 1971, the year I was born – and he looks younger than I do, and he's been coaching that long. It is ridiculous. Y'all both look great, T.A., come on. You both look great. I mean, he's 23 years older than me. The man has looked the same since he got into the league forever, coaching Miami. I mean, it's fascinating. He uh, He's a legend, and I, got, I was trying to find his quotes as you were – talking about it. i have to go listen to that one jeremiah you got the last you're the last one holding the mic here on on the beat on leap day february 29th close yeah. it out for us yeah happy leap day happy leap day one thing i was thinking about uh a little bit beyond nc state just because you mentioned uh notre dame obviously that'll be senior night for unc so i personally me and adam were talking about it a little bit the other day i'm personally interested in that day just because obviously you know you know cormac and Armando and and Paxson, you know, their time is up. But, I mean, uh, I actually forgot about it when we were talking the other day. Withers should have a COVID year should he 
choose to take it. And then obviously RJ Davis, you know, is this his last game at the Smith Center? You know, I mean, he's you really with him is you have to consider like the type of season he's had just and also the elevation from last year to this year. Like he's on the momentum that he kind of has. Um, you just got to wonder, you know, does he opt to stay, which I mean, he could do and, and get some NIL and everything, or does he, you know, try to go to the NBA, which obviously, you know, I'm not saying he wants to go this year or next year, but you know that he wants to, you know, get there at some point. So um, I think that'll be a very uh, interesting one. I think some factors that you never really had to consider in the past of is the guy going to stay, is he going to leave for, you know, as a senior, um, you know, you have to think about it now. So interested to see how uh, that goes. And also, I mean, it's, for what it's worth, Cormac Ryan facing his former team, uh, another little underlying storyline. But, yeah, so that's the game that I'm thinking about a little bit. It is uh, an interesting week for North Carolina. Schedule works out great for, for North Carolina this year. It's funny how, you know, we're talking about the ACC schedule and Carolina doesn't have to go to Cal or Stanford or SMU next year. They come, you know, I think two or three come here. I mean – this year has worked out exactly like Carolina needed. NC State, Saturday in the Smith Center, Notre Dame, Tuesday night, senior night in the Smith Center, and then drive a little bit ways down the road to face Duke in Cameron, which will be absolutely insane. Top 10 game. Uh, everybody will be healthy. People survived the court storming. Um, they made it through. Dagum Roy, the tweet on da that Dagum Roy tweeted is that I was under the impression that fella had lost his life. It was a, uh, it'll be an an epic one in the in Cameron. It's been an epic show tonight. Shout out to the two hundred plus that have been here. Shout out to Johnny T shirt and congruity. Shout out to Jeremiah, Evan, and Adam. They will have Smith Center covers tomorrow with Hubert. Y'all know what player you're getting yet? Does anybody know? It's got to be RJ. Not. I would think. Hoping we get one. Yeah, because yeah. it's been it's been a hit or miss. Baycott last week, which was a great interview as always. But Hubert, for sure, they'll be covering it. I'll be at the baseball game, 11 a.m. if you're so inclined to follow North Carolina baseball. It'll feel like going to a travel game, uh, reliving high school moments. But that'll do it for tonight. Thanks, everyone. Everyone be safe. We'll be back for post game, NC State, on Saturday.